Hello, and welcome to another episode of Anomalies. I'm one of your hosts, Dan Hall, and kind of a special show today because uh, a while back I was looking through the Olympia Parks and Rec catalog about the different classes that are taught through Olympia Parks and Rec, and I, I taught a cryptozoology class, and I noticed right above me there was somebody who was teaching an astrology class. So I contacted this person, Maya O'Brien, and we ended up doing a chart, an astrological chart on me. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Maya, thanks so much for being on our program. Really yes. Glad to have you. Thanks, Dan. Nice to be here with you today. And thank you for inviting me onto your podcast. Sure, anytime. Um, just a reminder to people who are watching this podcast to like and subscribe if you like what you're hearing. So here's what I'm going to start with, Maya. What do you do astrology? Tell me, tell me how Maya O'Brien ended up being an astrologer. Well, that's a great question, Dan. And I, I would like to say that it took a long time. It's been something that grew into my life gradually over um, many years. I didn't really um, have any moment where I had a big aha about wanting to study astrology, but I, I had experiences in um, when I was younger in childhood where I was um, put in touch with the awe of the universe. And some of those were when I was camping with my family in the mountains of Colorado. And one event in particular, we were um, camping at Lake Powell in Utah with our, um, the family had come along and brought our boat and we were doing water skiing and camping. And these were back in the days when the dam had just been built on the Colorado River in 1963. And we started going down there in 1966. So uh, it was just in the very early stages of its development. And um, many times we were uh, just one of a handful of people who were camping at Lake Powell. And I spent the night with my brother on, on the boat and so I had a view of the stars and the starry mm -hmm. sky mm -hmm. that just astounded me. I had never had um, been in a place where there was no light pollution. And that really had a big impact on me that, that lasted a long time. And over the years, I developed my... Um, career interests in the creative arts therapies and physical therapy. And I ended up um, working in a physical therapy profession for 35 years and also developing my interests in dance therapy. Mm -hmm. I have a master's degree in dance therapy from a Buddhist college in Colorado. Really? Uh, cool. Yes, and it provided me a, a very interesting comparison of Eastern and Western perspectives on health and healing. And um, that training, along with um, dance training as a dance teacher, um, really formed the foundation of my career that um, led me to work with people in a wide variety of settings and I just found that career very rewarding. Uh, I just really enjoyed working with people and teaching movement and um, sharing my passion for uh, health and healing through um, my therapy career. Um, gradually, my, my interest in astrology was kind of on the back burner, but I was dabbling in it over the years. And truly... I'd like to say that um, it was the death of my son in mm. 1996 that led me to um, have some really deep questions about the meaning of life and um, 
life experiences that um, kind of um, shook us up, like pulled the rug out from under mm -hmm. my feet and um, really led me to question um, a lot of my basic values in life. And I just had this phrase, um, I would have given the sun and the moon and the stars mm -hmm. to change what happened. I but you were. yeah, um, but it wasn't mine to change. It was mine to learn how to deal with it. And uh, so I made a lot of artwork. Uh, art therapy saved my life, mm -hmm. frankly. And in a lot of my artwork has um, the moon and the sun and the stars. Mm. And so that was leading me closer and closer to my interest in studying astrology. And then my husband and I had a really wonderful opportunity in 2006 to travel to Australia Oh, wow. And live on a biodynamic agricultural farm. And I came to learn there that um, biodynamic agriculture is about connecting the earth with um, the universe and the influences of the planetary energies on the earth and the plants and the animals and the people who populate the earth. And that was just a, a beautiful experience. We were there for nine months and working on the farm. It was a um, biodynamic agriculture was developed by Rudolf Steiner, who also developed the Waldorf schools of, oh, uh, well, cool. of yes. education. Familiar yeah. with those. Yeah. Uh, Steiner was really a man uh, way ahead of his time. He he did uh, developed a lot of his work in the 1920s in Europe. And um, that's where the owner of the biodynamic farm had um, been exposed to Steiner's work in agriculture. And so the owner of the farm had um, purchased this large avocado farm hmm. in Australia. And John, my husband, John, and I got to go work on the farm for nine months. Wow, that must have been an extraordinary experience. You know, it really was because the owner of the farm was teaching us about um, the connections between the planetary energies and the um, the way that they do farming with, without pesticides, without invasive um kind of brutal agricultural practices. Um, the only time there was a, a tractor on the, on the land was when they were um, harvesting. Also, they grew macadamia nuts. Uh, we weren't there for that part of the season, but um, just the, the beauty of that experience um, had a deep impact on me. And I read a book about this biodynamic agriculture called Betwixt Heaven and Earth. Uh -huh. And it was a little, a book of little short essays, about um, two to three pages each. And there's uh, probably 40 or 50 of them in this book. And it's, it was a way to open the door to study astrology. Mm. And that's what I've been looking for, was how how to open the door to study this because I was um, struggling with a, something that I think a lot of people struggle with and when they want to learn about astrology is that it, it seems overwhelming and very confusing and very complex in the beginning. And I think that scares a lot of people off. And so um, I had been looking for, you know, if maybe since um, the year 2000, when I was making all this artwork with the sun and the moon and the stars in it, I was uh, just being drawn more and more to study astrology. I didn't really know how to get started until I found this book. And um, then we moved back to Washington state where mm -hmm. we have been living now for 31 years and i found an astrology teacher 
right uh -huh. here in, in Olympia, Washington, that I've been studying with for 17 years. She, um, she uses a, what I'd call a, a modern astrology approach. And so I spent um, 10 years studying modern astrology. And along the way, I found a lot of resources, a lot of teachers, and I found something called the Northwest um, Astrology Conference that's put mm. on um, in near Seattle in Tequila um, every Memorial Day weekend for 35 years now. It's one of the main, um, the first large astrology conferences that's continued on for all these years. And at that time, it was in person. And I met teachers from all over the country, even all over the world, who would come to teach there. And um, I would say I had uh, a shotgun approach to my education at that time, just a smattering of this, a, a snippet of that, and started trying to put the pieces together to make sense. And... Um, the 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 longer I studied, the more confused I got. <laughs> and so I ended up putting it on the back burner. That was in uh, 2016. And then in 2020, I retired from my physical therapy job. And I was just instantly drawn into the deep study of astrology. Like mm -hmm. now's my chance. I get to really go deep. And I, right at that time, I found someone who was studying what we call traditional astrology that comes from um, the Hellenistic phase, the Hellenistic era of Greek and Roman times. Okay. And yeah, one, of the things, one of the things I've learned from you is that there are different forms of astrology. And so really yes. understanding the discipline you got to understand the different uh, aspects of it. Keep going. I didn't mean to interrupt there. No, that's good. That's a really good point, Dan. And this was um, uh, just one of those faded moments in time where um, I was, well, I was doing the conference to Norwalk again after having taken a four-year break from it. But this time it was on Zoom. Mm -hmm. And it was that was because of COVID in oh, um, right. in May of 2020, and so it was then that I met this teacher from Australia, who was teaching the traditional ancient methods of astrology, and this was like a whole new language to me, a whole new world, and it started answering the questions that I'd been having. Um, and the, um, started clarifying some of these places where I'd been so confused by modern astrology. And so I've been studying now with that teacher from Australia ever since then, for four years now. And we would call that, um, uh, I wanted to give the name of one of the books then that really um, put the whole thing in a new perspective for me. Um, this is actually the book that my teacher studied from. My teacher in Australia, her name is Kelly Surtees, S-U-R-T-E-E-S. -E -E I love her Australian accent mm -hmm. and um, just her beautiful animated face on Zoom. Um, I'm a member of her group that... Um, has access to six training videos per month. Wow. And in that um, training, she goes through every single daily um, planetary aspect, um, all the movement of the planets and what signs they're in and how they're interacting with each other and how that might affect our own personal birth chart. And it's, it's just really... Uh, beautiful to me because she's fluent in the language. And so mm -hmm. the book that I found uh, four years ago is called Astrology and the Authentic Self, mm. Integrating Traditional and Modern Astrology 
to uncover what? to uncover the essence of the birth chart. Maya, where could somebody purchase that book if they so wanted to? Can um, they get it on Amazon? Or? Yes, on Amazon. The author of this book, her name is Demetra George. Demetra George, okay. She happens to live in um, Eugene, Oregon. Hmm. And she's written um, other books. She's been a professor of astrology in college uh, college programs, offering astrology classes. She's been an astrologer for about 50 years. So and, let me, that, that prompts a question for me as somebody yes. who used to be a professor of political science and sociology. So you could become a professor of astrology? Do they offer degrees in astrology at any school that you might be familiar with? There was one school that tried to um, meet the requirements for um, an accredited program, but they couldn't quite meet all the requirements. Mm. And so it's not officially a bachelor's level degree in astrology, but they still have an astrology program. It's um, right north of Seattle in Linwood, and it's called Kepler, K-E-P-L-E-R, Kepler College. Okay, cool. And Demetra so somebody, George, go ahead. Somebody in our neck of the woods then who would be wanting to pursue that on an academic level could just go north and take advantage of that opportunity. Yes. Cool. Yes, and so um, Demetra George was one of the first people who helped introduce um, the discovery of the ancient teachings into the world of modern astrology. And this happened recently. It was just in the 1990s that um, a committee of uh, astrologers started translating some very ancient texts that had been written in uh, ancient Greek and Latin and had been um, discovered in collections all across Europe and the Middle East in the um, libraries and the museums and the private collections, um, the, the research just gathering the, the name of those texts um, was done in the 1700s mm. by, by one man, I don't remember his name, but it took him, him and his committee um, 50 years to just um, come up with a, a list of the names of all the books, but they were in other languages, so we couldn't read them in English. And I still don't quite understand the details of how it all happened, but they started getting translated and integrated into the teaching of astrology in the Western world in the 1990s. So um, Maya, it sounds like there's a cultural perspective that comes along with uh, astrology and depending upon which culture you're in, you're in you might get different interpretations would that be fair to say yes you know that's a really good point dan and i was going to um just share this little um see if i can find it here okay so um demetra's book uh, the uh, I'll just show it to you here, sure. okay. uh, if you can see that, mm -hmm. The um, Astrology and the Authentic Self so, mm -hmm. by Demetra George. So I went online to look up the book, and there was a seven-page article about the book. And that was very, um, very well written. But when I started wanting to prepare... Um, class materials. Once I read this book of Demetra's uh, three and a half or four years ago, I said, well, I can teach this stuff now. Mm -hmm. And because it cleared up all my confusion, now I understand why this is this and that is that. And um, so I started teaching introduction to astrology classes at the Parks and Recreation Department. And also at the have Pardon? I was going to say, which is how I came across you. That's right. That's how we met. And um, our classes were listed right next door to each other in the catalog. 
So I've been doing that for almost three years now, and I've just really enjoyed it. I really enjoy um, meeting the people who come, and I've had good attendance, and I've developed a whole notebook of um, my class materials. It's one and a half hours uh, for four weeks in a row, so uh, six hours total of class time. And I've developed the handouts from different sources, different classes I've taken, different teachers I've studied with, and put it together in a, in a way I would say, I wish I would have known this in the yeah. beginning. Sure. Right. When I started studying, I, I might have saved myself about um, 12 or 15 years of confusion, but um, it's never too late. And so once, I, once that started clearing up, I got answers to questions I'd had and um, things started really making sense for me and really shining a light on um, not only my own personal experiences, but also um, on the lives of people around me and, um, and in the world in general, uh, trends, like um, longer trends. Some of the cycles of astrology are a um, hundred years long, two hundred years long, some as many as a um, thousand years long, or even longer than that. The cycles that of the um, universal, I mean the the orbit of the planets in the universe. It's uh, really amazing. That's where astronomy and astrology Come meet. Together. Yeah. But astrology goes a little bit more in, a lot more in depth into the psychology of how mm. we're affected by those things happening around us in, in the universe. And um, we call that correspondences. We mm. might just think about um, just a simple example, like a lot of people will notice when the moon is full they'll say maybe they're they're kind of wide awake that night and they have a mm -hmm. hard time sleeping and they've got um this urge to go out and take a walk around the neighborhood and be out and about in nature when the moon is full and so that's a, a correspondence something that uh, we feel internally that is um you know related to some kind of external event like the full moon that's just a simple example. And then um, as I studied that more and more, it just added these layers and layers and layers of depth and richness to my interest in psychology. Uh, as I said, I have a master's degree in body-centered psycho psychology. And so I find that um, astrology gives a, a deeper and richer and broader and really rich picture of how each one of us is unique based on our astrology chart, based on the moment that we took our first breath. I've been listening a lot lately to, uh, I don't know, some are astrologers, but then a lot of them are psychics. So how would you relate um uh, psychic abilities to astrology or would you relate the, those two things you know i i wouldn't necessarily relate those two i would say that um over the years especially more so much more so now that i've been studying astrology online like so many of us have been since covid um you know just doing a lot more of our webinars and um, meeting our teachers and finding conferences and um, looking things up on, on the internet. Um, I've just been am amazed at the broad range of types of people who are, are attracted to astrology, uh, really from all over the world. I've been studying with um, uh, conferences from Europe, from London, from um Middle Eastern astrologers, Vedic astrology, um, a, a really very broad range of people interested, and also um, broad range who t who teach it now. And so um, it doesn't necessarily um, 
correlate, I would say, with psychic mm -hmm. abilities. Uh, maybe it, I would say it correlates with people who are sensitive to um, caring about people and wanting to be helpful. And I would just say at this point that the ethics of the astrologer is really important that you, if you're looking for an astrologer, you want to find someone with high ethical professional standards. And, and how do you, how, how do you determine that? Well, uh, for one thing, there's uh, several professional organizations okay. that are um, throughout the world. I haven't gotten all that involved yet, um, but I plan to. Um, one is called the Organization for Professional Astrologers. Um, there's just extensive research on astrology that's gone back, um, you know, certainly through the 1900s into this century now, the 21st century. Um, there's um, magazines and books, and there's actually a library in mm. Olympia that is um, a woman who was a student in the Kepler college School. astrology okay. program um basically when that program closed down she kept the collection of books oh. and she brought it with her to tumwater washington and bought a house and turned it into a library really where's that in tumwater um let's see uh very close to capitol boulevard and north okay um, by that safe way out there. <laughs> okay. And um, I got to work in the library. And so I got exposed to um, this whole historic collection of magazines and books. And a, a lot of what she offers now is online. And you can look that up under, um, it's called the Celestial Arts Education Library. Kaylee, C A. E L I Kaylee Institute. And anybody could do that. That library is open to anybody who's interested in uh, astrology. Would that be correct? Yes. Uh, it's called a research library where you would actually um, post a question to the um, librarian. Okay. They would do research on it. They don't actually check out the materials and let okay. people take them home. But if you live near here, you can go there in person and oh. uh, sign up for your research time. It's really fascinating. And that's where I've learned about all the different professional organizations. And um, I'm getting there. I haven't gotten quite that far yet in my studies. So I wanted to mention a little bit more, Dan, about the, um, the article that was written about Demetra's book where it talks about the, the history of the historical origins of astrology. And just a quote from the book, contemporary astrologers are heirs to a rich and profound tradition that inspires a sense of awe in this deep discipline. So uh, astrology records of uh, astrology are found going all the way back to 3000 BCE in um, Babylonian area, area. Evidence suggests using divin divination from celestial bodies to assess the general conditions of the land, the nation, the king, and the royal destiny was practiced in Mesopotamia, China, and the Indus Valley uh, starting around 3000 BCE. Those are the, um, and it was 500 BE, BCE uh, where they found the earliest evidence of natal astrology applying to um, individuals in society. And that was written in cuneiform. Oh, so this goes way back. Yes. Yes, it does. And then from there, um, it talks about the Hellenistic period of astrology, which is what uh, I've been studying mm -hmm, in Greece. And that time period would go from 150 BCE to 625 CE. The idea of divination by the stars spread from Babylonia into Egypt 
and mingled with other cultures, religions, and philosophies in Alexandria. Much of what we recognize today started to develop around that time of 150 BCE. Um, and then the Roman conquest of Egypt, um, a Hellenistic astrology spread throughout the Roman Empire. And over the next 700 years, hundreds of astrological texts were written in Greek and some in Latin and were preserved in Eastern Christian Byzantine monastic libraries. Hellenistic astrology was lost in Western Europe as the Roman Empire declined. Okay, mm. so again, that explains um, how how those original teachings got lost. So here's a question that just popped into my mind. And tell me if it's a, an educated question, because you know much more about astrology than I do. What can you learn about yourself or maybe what can, can you not learn about yourself from astrology? I'm well, use... that's a good good question. Go ahead. No, that, that's the question. What can you learn or what can't you learn about yourself using astrology? Well, I haven't found out yet what you can't learn. <laughs> okay, that's good. <laughs> what I'm finding is that the, the more I study it, the more it shines a light on, um, like I said, myself, the people around me, um, the clients I have now, I'm getting a lot of um, clients from my astrology classes who want to see me for um, a private individual session as well, like I did with you. And, um, you know, a lot of people come to a private session like that, or even classes wanting to learn more about themselves, people who are curious about um, various areas of their life that are represented in the astrology chart. And a lot of times will even come when they're facing um, difficulties and challenges in certain areas. Um, some of the main areas would be things like a career or mm -hmm. family life or personal health, or recent um, or past traumas that they're having difficulty resolving, you know, the, the death of someone close to them or um, things like that. They may come when they're in a time of a period of crisis or when they feel like a lot of things are changing and shifting in their lives and they don't understand what... Um, you know, what opportunities life is offering them and how they might um, kind of carve out a, a new path forward. Th things like that. Those are the types of questions people will come come to an astrologer with. Does that make sense? Yes, and, and uh, I, I want you to go ahead and state this. I did a reading with you. Just tell our audience what you, the cost of the readings you do and how long the process takes? Uh, my readings are $150 now, and that is about an hour and a half long session. And that also includes the uh, about two to three hours worth of preparation time that I do ahead of our appointment to um, really do the research into the basic natal chart of uh, when a person was born, what are the planetary influences that have um, stamped a blueprint on their life at the time of their birth, and also the transits, how the planets have moved through time, um, having an impact on that person's original blueprint as they travel through life. So this is a question that's more about popular culture. I've been hearing a lot of people talking about we're moving into the age of Aquarius. What does that mean? Well, Dan, that's a, a good question. Um, I would have to say that it's related to one of the longest planetary cycles, which is a 26,000-year cycle. And this has to do with the um, 
the, you know, the earth rotates on its axis, but that axis wobbles. Okay. And as it wobbles, it draws a circle in the sky and it takes um, 26,000 years to draw that one cycle. And that is called the precession of the equinoxes. And I learned about that in this, um, let me show you this original um, book I read in Australia called Betwixt Heaven and Earth by uh, Brian Keats, who is a, a well-known author in Australia. And um, that's where I learned about his work. And so um, what that means is that the the north star right now the um the axis of the north of the earth points to uh, the north star which is one of several stars along the path of this circle that the axis is drawing and this is some of the more um complex and higher level uh intermediate to advanced work in astrology it's not something i would normally introduce in an in introductory class but we could say that um an age would last about 2000 years and so wow. we're just coming out of what we would call the age of pisces and that relates to the symbol of the two fish that is used to um as an iconic image for Christianity. Mm. Before that was the age of Aries. And the symbol for Aries is the ram. Oh, wow. And for the 2000 years um, before the birth of Christ, there is a lot of imagery around um, the age of the ram. Before that in Egypt, the time of Egypt, it was the age of the bull. And that lasted 2,000 years. That's about as far back as we've been able to study the history okay. of these eras or ages. So we've got, so it's going backwards through the signs. It went from Taurus the bull to Aries the ram to Pisces the fish. And now we're moving into the age of Aquarius, but the transition takes about two, 200 years. Wow. So uh, I want to be conscientious of our time here because I know okay. there's something else you've got to go to. Let's, okay. deal, let's deal with Dan's chart because okay. one of the things you told me, mm -hmm. and it really showed um, kind of the influence that uh, astrology can have in your life, you asked me for my birth date and my birth time. And I was born 11, 10 at night. And you said, well, that prob that could explain several things. One of which is I'm a total night owl. I like to stay up all hours of the night, sometimes be up till two or three in the morning. And I, I didn't realize that my birth time had an influence over that. Yes, that's a great point. Um, the, the basic birth chart shows two different cycles. Can I pull up this um, image of a birth chart? Yeah, on, there should be a on share. My screen share? Yeah, at the Pardon? bottom. There, sh there should be something at the bottom of your... Uh, there should be something at the bottom of your... Uh, do you see the screen share? Oh, there you go. Yes, there okay, it there is. There you go. Yep, yep. So this is a, an image of a um, blank birth chart. And I just want to say, um, here's the list of the, um, the order of the signs. And these could be broken down into seasons of the year. And so we would have the season of spring starts with Aries. The middle of spring is Taurus. The end of spring is Gemini. And these always go in this order. The uh, summer 
starts with the sign of Cancer, and then Leo, and then Virgo, Libra, Scorpio, and Sagittarius is the season of autumn, and the season of winter is Capricorn, uh, let's see, Aquarius, and Pisces. So these signs would go around the outside of the chart mm -hmm. like this in a uh, what we would call a counter clockwise direction can you see that can yes, you see my I arrow i can't move it yes very okay. well okay so uh the question is when we so that's that's the cycle of the year the cycle of the day is represented by these numbers around the inside mm -hmm. and these are always in this position like the face of a clock and these represent different areas of life and these are called the houses these are over here are called the signs so the first house here on the left side of the chart would represent the east and this top of the chart would represent high noon. Mm -hmm. And the right side is the west, where the sun is going down at night. Mm -hmm. And the bottom here is mid midnight. Midnight, okay. And you were born, I believe, with your sun somewhere down here in the wee hours of the morning. Um, no, let's see. You were born what time of day, Dan? 11, 10, 9. Y yes. So that put your son here in this, um, this is called the fourth house. Mm -hmm. And so we found out that the fourth house is about um, family roots and um, ancestors and kind of values and um, belief systems that, that form a foundation of our our values and not only did you have the sun in this house but you had um three other planets with it there and that was mercury and saturn and neptune so that's that's the first part is the cycle of the day when we know what time of day someone is born that will tell us what part of the chart um their sun was in so you were born at night, this time of night here. Now, the, the, the next part is that knowing the time of day you were born gives us the sign that is on the horizon in what we call the first house on the horizon at dawn. And that's called our rising sign or our ascendant. And that is another one of the um, dominant themes of a lifetime is determined by what is your rising sign, your ascendant. And so by knowing the time of day that you're born, we will be able to determine um, what sign was on the ascendant. So we also found by looking at your chart, you already knew this, that your um, that you were born in October. And so that's part of the cycle of the year, the outer cycle here. And that put your son in the sign of Libra. Did you already know that your son was in Libra before I met you? Yeah, uh -huh. yeah I did. No, you no. knew that. Mm -hmm. yeah. a, lo a lot of people know that uh, basic information, what, what sign their son is in. But um, then you ask the next question is, what sign was in the first house? What was your ascendant or your rising sign? And um, I'd say it's maybe a third of people know that when I first meet them, when I ask them that question. And um, so most of the others, like 60 to 70 percent of people, do not know their rising sign. And, and that would be me, because I didn't know my rising sign either. Yeah, so that's an, another main determinant of our personality through life. And so we found out that on your horizon, 
in your first house, your rising sign is cancer. And so cancer has a different vibe to it than um, Libra. So I'm just going to look at my little handouts here. These are some of the materials that I use for teaching. For example, the, um, the sign of Libra, and we learned this about you, uh, that you're courteous, <laughs> cooperative, harmonious. You have a sense of justice. Yes, that's very, very evident in who Dan is. Very that's evident. right. And we found out more about that by um, our interview, by asking you questions about your, your history and your, your work history and your education. And um, it was just right on target there, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. It Can was. you share with us a little bit about that, um, how that relates to the Libra? Well, um, I have been, I taught political, I was a teacher, for one thing, for 16 years. I taught political science courses and sociology uh, courses. And I think particularly in the political science uh, realm of things, there were things that related to justice that uh, related to equality, that related to fairness. And that's very important to me. So yeah, that does strike a chord. Yes, yeah, so I would say it confirms, you know, it was a, a confirmation both directions that um, we, we really saw how that's the, the foundation in that fourth house, the, the roots that you've um, built the foundation of your adult life on through your career, right? So that made a lot of sense. Once, yeah, once we yes. both understood that about you, um, it, it, I would say it would shine a light on um, what, we, what we learned about you by discovering that. And then we maybe, saw that you had you, go ahead. I was gonna say maybe even pointing to some of my career choices. Yes. Definitely. Um, and then we looked at your, the cancer sign, the sign of cancer then was on in, in your first house. The first house is about identity and our, how, um, how we come across to other people, like the first impressions that we make on other people, it really even as to go so far as to say your appearance and your, um, your style, your style of how you wear your hair, how you dress, um, and your, your vitality in life, kind of how you um, move through life with purpose is based on your identity in the first house. And so you have cancer rising and the qualities of cancer are sensitive, caring, protective, intuitive, indirect, and maybe even easily hurt mm -hmm. related to being sensitive. And so that gave us another layer of information about um, kind of your, your core values in life and how you, brought, how you bring that into the world. Does that relate to you? Does that resonate with you? Yeah, I think, I think all that stuff was very accurate. Uh-huh. Again, so it kind of confirms something that you already knew about yourself. And we see that it was kind of written in the stars there. It was part of your basic blueprint. And then I also wanted to um, mention, Dan, where we found your moon. And that's one of the other, um, the three main factors that we would start with in the astrology um, reading. And this is what I teach to in my classes, um, which is the, the position of the sun, the, uh, the condition of the sun. Is it in a, a good condition in relation to other planets? Is it in a challenging position? Um, and what's its relationship to the first house? And that's the second um, dominant theme that we're looking at is um, what do you bring forth in your um your basic vitality your first impressions on people 
in the first house. And the third factor then is looking at the position of your moon. And so we found your moon. This was your um, Libra, your sun in Libra in the fourth house. We found your moon over here in the sixth house. And the sign in that house would be Sagittarius. If this was Libra, this would have been Scorpio, and this would have been Sagittarius. And uh, the sixth house is a house of, of health and daily routines that lead us to either better health or challenges with our health. It's about our um, kind of daily work habits, how we find ourselves um, managing the work that we do on a daily basis. I was looking for the description of Sagittarius, which is honest, adventuresome, outdoor loving, optimistic, faithful, and opinionated. Do any of those resonate with you? Yeah, particularly the opinionated one. <laughs> I can be very, very opinionated about things. Okay. Yeah, and I, I've also found you to be, just by getting to know you, um, that you're generally optimistic and um, adventurous. You like exploring all kinds of new very adventures. Curious. Yeah, I'm a curious person. Yeah, and that relates to um, the idea that Sagittarius is where your moon lives. So your moon um, relates to your emotional body. I have another handout here that I share with my class on um, the nature of the moon is about our emotions and our instincts and our physical body and our sense of security. So you find that um, in, in the sixth house where your daily routines and what you do to help take care of your, your health and your work life and your daily activities um, lives in the sixth house. Does that resonate with you? It does. Good. So we, we start with those a few simple things. And uh, along the way, well, I have found um, in, in my classes at Parks and Recreation that there's kind of a range of knowledge. Some people come to that class with absolutely no knowledge at all. Mm -hmm. of astrology and other people have dabbled in it over the years in fact a lot of people i'm just going to stop this screen share for now and how do i get back to that picture of me uh, i stop just sure i think this is there. Where I'm at. here we are okay okay so there's there's a range in fact um in this past group, I had 10 people in my class. Um, three of them were older women. Um, three of them were younger women. And then um, the rest were in between. I'd say mm -hmm. some in their 30s, some in their 70s, or even 80s, and mm -hmm. then the rest in between. And so it was a really broad, diverse group of people. And uh, several of the older students had had their chart written, read for the first time as long as 40 years ago. Wow. And they'd had an interest in astrology ever since then, and they'd been dabbling with it and reading their daily horoscope in the newspaper and mm -hmm. looking so things in, up online. And Here's a question that pops into my mind. What would, why would a person want to have several astrological readings throughout their life at different uh, times in their life? That's a great question, Dan, um, because the planets are on the move. All the time. All the time. And so it took me a long time to understand that as well, to really be able to picture the motion of the planets moving through the signs over um, long, sometimes long periods of time. So, for example, we would say the moon goes around the Earth in 30 days. So the moon is going to make its way all around the outside of that chart that we showed at, looked at in th every 30 days. 
the sun is going to take one year to go mm -hmm. around that same outside of the chart. And so by the time the moon comes around 30 days, the sun would have moved on to the next sign. So we're going to have a new moon in each sign as the sun moves around the outside and the moon comes around to meet up with it. We would also have the opposite um, position from new moon, which is a full moon. And that's when the moon and the sun are on opposite sides of that circle. And so we would also have one full moon in each sign per year. Now, um, Mercury, I got to rely on my memory here, uh, takes about 88 days to go around the sun. Venus takes about 165 days to go around the sun. So we can track those. Those mm -hmm. are um, pretty, pretty fast moving in terms of our daily activities and how those might have an how those changes of planetary energies might impact our personal chart. Um, the next one beyond the Earth is Mars, and that takes two years. And so th these are called the inner planets, and that would be the Sun, Mercury, Venus, the Moon, and Mars. And those are considered to affect our own inner personality the most. And so those are pretty um, set in our nature, in our uh, original blueprint of our birth. And that's what we would call the condition of those planets. What, what is the condition of those in our birth chart? And so we saw, um, we, looked at, we looked at that when we looked at your chart. And then the next planet out is Jupiter. And Jupiter takes 12 years to go around. So we're just going to experience Jupiter for one year at a time in every sign as it goes around and it meets up with other planets that are moving through the sky, but it also meets up with the planets that are in our own birth chart. And we might experience that type of um, interaction with um, changes that are going on in our lives or changes in our um, external or internal experience of life. And the next one out from there is Saturn. Saturn takes 29 years oh, yeah. to go around just once. And so we're all going to experience Saturn returning to the place where it was when we were born at about the age of 29. And that's called our first Saturn return. And that's a big milestone. In tr Saturn has to do with um, maturing, um, becoming more responsible for being an adult, taking on more of the adult type activities of, of life at the age of 29. The second time Saturn comes around to that same point called the second Saturn return is about age 58. And that's gonna happen for most every, most, all of us, all of us who survive will experience right. that roughly within um, a year or two. You know, sometimes Saturn moves a little faster than others, but roughly around the age of 58. If we're Makes, lucky, man, we can move lucky. beyond that. Yeah, 29 more years. 29 yeah. more years to get to our third Saturn return. But along the way, uh, Saturn is is offering us lessons. Can I just read to you what my notes sure. say about Saturn? Sure. Okay, the nature of Saturn. It's, it's the outer visible planet. In ancient astrology, they only um, worked with what they could see. And so they could see these, these first seven visible planets that we've talked about, the sun, the moon, Venus, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. Those are what they call the seven traditional visible planets. The other ones that are beyond that, that, that we work with, are Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto that were discovered after the invention of the 
um, telescope, right. starting with Uranus in the 1700s. Neptune was discovered in the 1800s. Pluto was discovered in the um, 1930s. Oh, and Pluto has been demoted. It's no longer a planet, if I remember my astronomy. Well, it's considered a dwarf planet, but dwarf I would planet. say it was uh, demoted in the eyes of the astronomers, but not in the eyes of the astrologers. The astrologers, too. Oh. It did not lose any status Good in point. terms of its impact on us. Pluto has a 240-year cycle. Uh, Neptune has a 165-year cycle. And Uranus has an 84-year cycle, which is about the age of an average lifetime. Hmm. And so these, it will come around for seven years, once in every sign through a lifetime. And we would call these once in a lifetime experiences or opportunities. And so we can look at the outer, the outer planets and their influence on our birth chart as well. But they're not visible to the naked eye. Saturn mm -hmm. is the last planet that we can see. And its light is very dim because it's very far away. far away. And so it deals with things that um, are things like self-discipline, hard work, responsibility, um, coming to terms with reality. And some people don't like those kind of Saturn wor words. <laughs> uh, coming to terms with reality. I can think of some cases where that might not be too pleasant yeah. to have to aspire to. Yes. So I have a, a, a client right now I'm working with who's in her second Saturn return. Mm. And she's kind of um, kicking and screaming about it all the way. She doesn't want to deal with getting older and um, facing um, the responsibilities of taking care oh, of her, herself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So my, I don't really want to be sensitive to our time because yes. I know you've got something else. Coming Thank up you. here. So uh, two things. If somebody wants to have a reading like I did um, with you, how do they go about doing that? Uh, the best way is to text me at my um, number 360-773-6807 or to send me an email. I, I get so many emails it's kind of like um, the the mailbox in the the junk mail in the mailbox. Uh, there's a, yeah. just a lot of emails, so sometimes things get lost there. It's better to text. Okay. And the other uh, question would be, how does uh, one take your classes through Ole Parks and Rec? How how uh, frequently do you do the classes? And uh, I guess there are some things you can look up. Holy Parks and Rec on the website, and they'll tell you how to register for those classes. But how often could they do that? That's right. The um, Parks and Recreation puts out a brochure every three months. They So they call it quarterly. They've got their uh, our fall quarter just finished. We've got our winter quarter catalog um, is coming out in December, and that's for the classes that go from January through March. Um, then we've got our spring catalog, and I'm also teaching. I teach in the fall, winter, and spring. You're and, busy. Yes, and I teach. Um, just look this up here. Uh, we've got our introduction to astrology class that comes first, uh, and that starts in January, uh, like the 18th of January. It meets on Saturday mornings from 10:30 to 12. And that goes for four weeks in a row. And then we start our intermediate astrology class that um, begins um, following uh, in February, the, the 22nd of February. That also goes for an hour and a half, 1030 to 12, and for four weeks in a row. I also teach at the Senior Center, mm -hmm. and that's on Thursdays. And that is also starting, um, their catalog comes out also in December. And uh, that class is also starting in, in January. You're a busy lady. Yeah, I really enjoy teaching. I really enjoy getting to know people. 
I'm also teaching my uh, introduction to the creative arts therapies classes at both okay. the Senior Center and the oh, um, Parks and Re Rec. Oh. Those will be oh. listed in the December catalogs. So you can register online, you can register by phone, or you can register in person for any of those classes. Plenty of opportunities to learn stuff from a wonderful person. So thank you, Maya, for being on the show with us. Um, we do minimal editing to this. Once the show is up, I'll send you a link to it, to oh, your great. email. And just thanks so much for being on with great. us. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank you so much for inviting me, Dan. Really a pleasure to work yeah. with you today. And we'll see you in the future. Okay, we'll see you around. Okay, okay right, good. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.